satisfying is it to get to this point where a more complete telling of your father's story can really come out and be told? Well, it's it's something that I'm I've wanted to see happen for 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 a long time now. I think he was uh, in, incorrectly labeled uh, as reclusive and things like that. I don't even want to say the words because they're they're just they're just not true. And and I think people when they see this film and they hear the words of, of many of his friends and colleagues and people with whom he served, they'll 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 agree that, that that's they they just didn't know the real the real man. And. In, in, in many ways, my understanding is the story is, in, in some respects, a very ordinary one. He grew up, was born and grew up in a very ordinary place, um, but became extraordinary through the things he did. Is that more true than the myth that was built up around him? My father always said that, um, you know, success is where preparation meets opportunity. He prepared himself. He had a love of aviation, a love of aircraft design, and that's what he wanted to be when he grew up. He wanted to be a, an airplane designer, essentially. He became a pilot because he figured that at some point, it's good to know the airplane from the inside, right? And, and uh, so he prepared himself, he prepared himself, and he uh, continued to pursue those, those passions. And those passions led him you know, to service in the Navy, then to uh, flying the X-15 uh, as a test pilot, and eventually to to the astronaut corps. And I, although many people would consider the moon landing the highest point, were there many high points before that? I and mean, as you said, there were many um, things of flying the test planes and everything. It's, it seems like he was on a continual progression up. He really loved being a test pilot, and I think you know, uh, even applying to the astronaut program was something that was not an easy decision for him because he had already his dream job uh, in, in, in really exploring hypersonic flight, um, control, dynamics, all, all of those things. Uh, he was uh, very, very happy in his, in his, in his role there. So it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision to, to potentially walk away from that to a program that really had a lot of unknowns and problems that needed to be solved. So. And what do you think is the enduring wonder to people of this story? Because obviously recently we had First Man, which you um, uh, contributed to. There's the new Apollo film, and now this. What, what do you think people is, um, has people excited about this continually? Well, I think, you know, maybe it's because I think we're on the cusp of a, of a new age of exploration, right? We're talking about going back to the moon, to really learning how to live and, and work there, how to mine for water, all of these things by 2024. And that's, I think that's just the beginning, right? Uh, we want to learn to do these things on the moon because we're going to have to learn, we have to know them to, 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 to be on Mars and, and any, anywhere else that we want to go. So the moon just happens to be the closest, you know, the closest body that uh, that we can that we can apply these, yeah. So, and um, what do you hope people who see this film take away from it most of all? Well, I think through this particular film, I, I hope they get to know my father better than than they maybe think they do. And uh, as as far as all of these events, I really think that uh, that they have the opportunity to ignite a new generation of of young people to study science and engineering and math and, 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 and prepare, right? Prepare themselves for those opportunities that are coming in the future. So how has the timing worked out for this for you? Because obviously you were doing a bunch of other things before this and yeah. then this has come up and it's, with being the 50th anniversary is fabulous timing. Yeah. How, how, does that, how does that timing come about? Well, I mean, you know, having made a lot of uh, space films, uh, we were well aware of the 50th anniversary coming up, and you know, and I, and so I've, I've been, I was editor on a lot of films about the Apollo uh, landings, and then having switched to directing as well, we always knew this was approaching, and we, we had an idea for uh, a, 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 a project about about Neil, but it was um, one of our investors, one of our key investors, uh, Jim Hayes, met uh, Gareth Dodds, one of the producers, at Gene Cernan's funeral. And Jim said to, uh, to Gareth, hey, how about making a film about my friend Neil? 
and that's where it started. Now, it left us a tiny bit on the back foot because we weren't, we weren't sort of, we hadn't worked out what the project we wanted to, to do would be. So we had to just basically go as quickly as we could into production because, as you said, we are pretty busy. And at the time when that happened, we were just finishing our previous film, Spitfire. And so there was a pretty big overlap. So in between finishing the post-production for Spitfire um, and, and the launch of it, we then went out to the States for our first shoot and gathered our first interviews with, all the, uh, with some of the contributors. Um, we, you know, we had some pretty epic journeys around the US you know, in planes and in cars and all the rest of it to, to gather our interviews. But bit by bit, we pieced it together. And, uh, and, and we just, you know, we had a, a fantastic editor, Paul Holland, who, because uh, this is the first film that I haven't edited, uh, it, it was uh, my, so this is my, my sort of first time hands off, <laughs> yeah. keeping my hands away from the mouse, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it all just kind of fell into place. And, you know, every film has its challenges and its ups and downs, but it seemed to go pretty smoothly. And, uh, and so, you know, here we are tonight. The premiere seems unbelievable. What is it about this story that still captivates people 50 years later? Because in some ways it is a long time away, but it's still very prescient. Well, it is prescient. I agree. I think, it's, I think the thing is it, it's, it, it represents mankind's ability to dream. I mean, I was, it, it's, it's, it's probably mankind's greatest adventure and exploration. Um, you know, people compare it to Columbus sailing the Atlantic. But with this, there's a technical challenge as well. Um, and we look back at it and think, oh, how did they manage to do it with such tiny computers? Well, at the time, they were huge computers. The, the Lunar Module had a 32 kilobyte memory computer. I mean, it seems staggeringly tiny now. But of course, at the time, it was the cutting edge. NASA had the world's biggest concentration of computing power. They had four megabytes of computing power in Houston. But that's how they ran it, and that's how they made it work. So I, I, think, I think it still stands as an incredible achievement because the development of those rockets, the development of those spacecraft, the, the training of those astronauts, for all the, the, the knowns and unknowns that were out there, all worked. And it was this incredible pyramid of 400,000 people right up to the tip of the pointy end where you know, Neil and Buzz stepped out of that lunar module onto the surface of the moon. But then the other great achievement, of course, is getting them home. Um, but I think... I think it's just one of those heroic human endeavours that people who say it never happened are just missing out on this amazing adventure. Yeah. And the, the thing, one of the things for me is, and what the film that I understand is portraying, is that he's such a normal person in very many ways in his upbringing and his life, doing such extraordinary things. Do you think there's a danger in idolising people and not understanding them properly which is what this film is rem remedying really yeah i mean it's, it's hard to i mean uh, having made spitfire and a number of other films people like neil would hate to be described as heroes and, and amazing and things like that what they wanted to be regarded as i think is is good at what they did and neil was was very very good at what he did but he started young he became a pilot at 16 you know, before he could drive he went into the navy he became a fighter pilot um, just so he could go to college. Then the Korean War came, so he then had to deal with that. So it was Neil's reaction to events, and he was evidently just a cool customer who could keep calm. And that made him stand out head and shoulders above everyone else, perhaps. And so bit by bit, he, he moved from one job to the next. You know, so he's, he, he joins the NACA, then he gets c recruited into NASA. He flies the X-15, this incredible rocket plane that goes right to the edge of the atmosphere. Um, and he was the only astronaut uh, in, that fir in that group who'd, who, who'd been selected, who, who flew the X-15. There was a, a couple of others later. Um, so he was just very, very good at what he did. And I think the film sets out to, to, to say that. He was not, um, you know, he was not amazing. He was not special. He would hate to be described like that. He was just brilliant at what he did. And, and, he, and he created an atmosphere of calm around him. So his, his crew of Apollo 11, Mike Collins and Buzz Aldrin, were, I, I, I should imagine, just inspired by his leadership example and, and what he could do. Tell us what being in space has done for you, how, that, how you think that's kind of changed you as a person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, really fortunate. I think um, I always try to tell people how grateful I am for the experience. And... Um, 
we do a lot of really complex things in space. We build these machines in space that mimic what Earth does for us naturally and keeps us alive up there. And while all that complex stuff is happening, I think I came back with three really simple lessons to share. And that's that we live on a planet, you know, we all know that, um, we're all Earthlings. And the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. And I think, I intellectually I knew that before I flew in space, but I didn't really, it wasn't like in my mind every day. And it is now, and I want it to be like in everybody. So, so is it about communicating that experience, which is one, one reason this is so important, is to communicate the experience of seeing this world from an entirely different point of view? Yeah, I think, I, I think a film like this, it, I think it really reintroduces people to certainly the mission and what was going on to the people that were part of it. But in the end, it really is about this, like who and where we all are in space together. And I think it's great. I mean, I love that with this 50th anniversary, as we're, we're reflecting, I think, on all the wonderful stuff that happened then, our opportunity to see Earth from space, but it's also giving us a really great chance to see ourselves again and then look to the future. How do we kind of readapt as Earthlings on this planet and acknowledge that? And sometimes I get the feeling that people who have the checkbooks which pay for this don't really understand it. How important is it to have people funding this who really understand and, and get what it is that people, like folks like NASA are trying to do? Yeah, I think, you know, it's another reason why I love these films because there's not a, I don't know, the public messaging has never been good from NASA or any of the space programs, you know, the, the established, they do a really good job speaking to the people that already love NASA. We need to have creative ways like this film, or I thought my artwork would be this way, to communicate with audiences that don't know we have a space station. You know, to, to make them aware of that and that everything we're doing in space, and I think about when we go back to the moon and establish a permanent presence there, when we go on to Mars, ultimately it's all about improving life on Earth. And everyone needs to know that. Well, what's the most exciting thing you see coming through the space program in the next maybe five to 10 years? I think it is this, um, this goal of going back to the moon. And, and not just doing it as any one country, but continuing on with you know, perhaps the legacy of what we're doing on the space station right now with 15 different countries working together and realizing that we need to leverage each other. We need to take advantage of the different skills and, you know, expertise and just this blend of diversity that makes everything, I don't know, more successful anyway and go to the moon that way. And then that'll give us this really great platform for doing better things down here on Earth, but getting us to Mars and other places too. And while folks like me who watch the moon landings on TV will be quite nostalgic about it, what do you hope the young folks who see this film will go on to do with the lessons they take away? Yeah, I, I mean, I hope that, that they will look at it, and even if they didn't even know it happened, I want them to know, first of all, and then that hopefully they can reflect on it in a way that acknowledges the real legacy of it, you know, what these what these people did on the moon, I mean, the whole program, but, but take it in a way to look at what do we do for our future? How do we kind of do one more giant step off of that and, you know, lead the way to the future too? Now, you were born in the year of the last Apollo mission. What? Now, how do you know that? Wikipedia. That really weird. Wikipedia. Yes, I was, I was. So, you know, this, yeah, they sort of passed, they had all done just about the time I was growing up. But they were this mythic legend thing. I mean, it's like saying you were born three years after Columbus. We still heard a lot about Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> and they're at that level of exploration. So they were they were these huge icons. I mean, I mean, I all through the 70s, it was a very different time in terms of celebrity and stuff like that. But something as solidly fantastic as being the first man on the moon was always a huge thing. And what's the wonder in this for you? because this is a story that hasn't faded over the years. It's still, you know, there's, there was First Man, now there's another Apollo film, and then there's this. What, what do you think is the kind of perpetual wonder that we have? I'm, 
it, the fact that we've not repeatedly done it, it's not, you know, there are queues of people walking up Everest and it's actually becoming problematic at the moment, like whatever. There are achievements, many people run four minute miles. There are achievements that get repeated. And because of the sheer cost and effort and 400,000 people that are required to, to build a spacecraft and run the whole operation, we've not come back in 50 years, or we're not coming back in about 47 years, excuse me. The, uh, so it remains a thing that only 12 people have done, of whom seven are alive, eight are alive maybe at the moment. So it is still a dwindling number of people who have actually done this. I would love to see this become mundane. I would love to see this become very ordinary to go to the moon, like whatever. But there's also the fact that you can't see Everest from your back window everywhere on the planet. You can't see a four minute mile, whatever. But you, you can't see the Marianas Trench. But you can go into your garden and look up, and the moon is always there. And always there, that 240,000 miles away, like whatever. And so I think it'll, it'll eternally be a thing. It's our closest neighbour in the sky, and it'll always be the thought of being, it being just that close and we could reach it. It will always be enticing to us. And with Neil being such an iconic figure, do you think that's kind of mythical myth that's built around him? This this film kind of takes that apart and makes it brings out his normal life. Well, I, I think there's an element in this film, which is a thing which is worth saying that actually it's very easy to become regarded as a recluse if you simply just go about a normal life. The grand, and people were so taken with the uh, with a huge contrast between he was the most famous man in the world and now he's quietly working as a professor in Cincinnati like whatever therefore he must have chosen to do this sometimes greatness is dropped in the lap of people who are just very very skilled but don't wish to be you know hugely famous about it whatever it is. there is a thing about people who are both ordinary and extraordinary they, uh, or who are ordinary with an amazing skill at an extraordinary time and he was very much that he was a very ordinary normal man who just happened to be one of the greatest pilots the world has ever produced at a time when that was exactly what was needed and at the moment there's a little bit of a war on science from some factors what do you think this contributes and what do you think is the most exciting thing that's happening in science at the minute oh my god listen how do you I mean I, the, the fact Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one of those first. Where you came from. Yes, there is, and there's kind of perennially a, a kind of a culture war with science at the, at the moment, like whatever. But NASA are bullish about the next five years. I mean, there's now we're in an age of commercial space flight, and so we're going to begin to see a lot more people taking to the skies than we had before, and including, we're hoping, many people going back to the moon. This is not a rare thing. When they went to Antarctica in 1911, they didn't go back for 60 years. The uh, 50, 60 years. It, this is the way it works. There's, there's, there's a crazy push to be the first, and then it takes a while to, to build up the kind of just the infrastructure to go and do it on a more regular basis. We might be entering into that phase now, where we'll start building permanent placements on the moon, like whatever. So I think this is actually far from being a. Very, this will remind people, I think, of the amazing collaborative effort that was done. It'll st strike people about how it was done by the seat of their pants with technology that we can fit inside a clicker for your car. That's how level we're talking about. Not even like the old idea, it's in your phone, it's literally in the bip bip of your car, right? The, uh, but we're going to do it again. Uh, and I think that's going to be just as exciting a second time. What is it, do you think, is the enduring story of the Apollo missions and Neil's, Neil's contribution in particular? Um, to me, it's a, the culmination of a crazy dream. Um, when um, Kennedy made the Rice speech and pledged to get someone to the moon by the end of the century, it really was quite a crazy dream. They had no idea how, how they were going to do it. And yet, uh, uh, they threw money at it, and people know about the money, but they threw brains at it to try and make this happen. And it was a, a, a huge, diverse team of people working together to achieve this. And I think that's one of the things that Neil in the film keeps on referring to. It's not just sort of me stepping out, it's mankind stepping out, humankind stepping out, but it's also this huge team effort, the culmination of that. But I think it also showed what we can aspire for in the future. If we can step from, the, from Earth and go on to another body, where else can we go in the future? And this, this story's endured for 50 years through several generations. I mean, I grew up watching the moon landings on, on TV. Yes. Um, Dara was just slightly after that. But what do you think is it that people still keep trying to unpack from this event? I, th I think it's one of the things, one of the uh, greatest achievements of humankind that we've ever known. Um, we build, I'm, I'm a space scientist. I build probes. I send them out into space. But to send people out into space is a challenge all of its own. And so to send someone to the moon, one of the things is we see the moon. Humankind have been watching the moon ever since we could look up. And so to, uh, the idea of someone going there 
uh, I, I think it just sort of uh, changed our knowledge, changed the sort of the, the parameters of stuff. If we can do that, what else can we do? So I think it really was a sort of a, a major stepping stone that it will be marked in history. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting because I go out and see lots of school kids, and um, I, I tell them about the moon landings. And they're, like, oh, they're not so familiar with it these days. But when I, I sort of I, I like to reiterate the the big amazing achievement that it was, and so in that 50 years we haven't really done anything in a similar vein yet. But I think the next stop is definitely Mars, and uh, the kids are getting excited about that now. <laughs> Probably in some cases more exciting than their parents. Do you find that there's still some, you know, there is still some doubt and vocal resistance against it? But do you find that's impeding your work or it just doesn't really get in the way? I don't think, no, it doesn't impede my work. I mean, people ask a lot of questions about space. And at the time of the moon landings, people were asking questions again. Should we be spending all the money on this when there's lots of other places we can spend money on? Uh, as a space scientist, of course, I'm slightly biased. <laughs> But at the same time, space helps us here, uh, 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 helps humankind here on Earth. Um, I, I think we, we sort of use space base, some of the space base I've built help us understand climate change, help us understand shipping in the waters of Singapore, so we can actually look at the Earth. But I think it also gives us something else, it's like art and poetry. By looking out there, sometimes we get a better understanding of ourselves. And I think the moon landings did that. I, I think one of the things that was mentioned in Armstrong is um, uh, Neil looking at the Earth, sort of silhouetted in the blackness of space. And many people think that that image is what sort of inspired the environmental movement and actually get, got us to think about our planet as a whole and think of, about our planet as something that needs to be nurtured. So I think going out there can really actually affect us here on Earth. <laughs> and, the, and the story of Armstrong in this film is about somebody who was born in a normal place, had a fairly normal upbringing, but devoted himself to his passion and ended up doing something amazing. I mean, in your own life, how, how has that worked out? Because you've obviously come quite, quite a long way I'm very impressed. Um, so, 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 as an outsider looking into the world of science, how do you do that? <laughs> well, I think science is one of the places where education, I think, is the key. And so, yes, Neil, Neil sort of was brought up in a sort of a, he was a, a farm guy, a farm boy, and he was brought up in a very, very simple life. But um, I think it's aspiration. I like to call it the desire to aspire. And because of Neil's uh, arms sort of out on the moon, he gave me a desire to aspire, to aspire to get out there myself. And I think that's the key. It's the power of a crazy dream. If you think high enough and crazy enough, you struggle to get there, overcome hurdles. And I think most people will be amazed by what they can achieve just by having a crazy dream. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!